Hello, hello. Um, cameraman, I'm very active, so I'm going to put you to work today. Uh, I'm Vivian Castillo, and I'm speaking on the discipline of hope. Um, I'm trying to trust my gut more these days, so I completely rewrote this talk three days ago. So you're on the journey with me. But um, I was trying to think about what's the best way to kind of share what I feel like is the temperature of the UX industry and community. And um, <clears throat> I'm a part of a couple different entrepreneurship groups and communities. And in May, I went to this entrepreneurship conference. And, uh, and these are people who, from small mom and pop shops to like, they're just making bread. And, um, and I remember afterwards, I came back and I was talking to my friend Bezad and I was like, I don't think I want to go to a UX conference again. And he was like, what makes you say that? And I was like, I'm at this entrepreneurship conference and these people don't know me, but they want me to win. They are excited for me. They are so generous in their resources and connecting me to their networks and not trying to flex. And they believe that there's enough for all of us to partake in this. I'm like, and they don't know me, but they just, they want me to win. And then I look at the UX community in its current state. I'm not necessarily feeling that vibe. Um, I think there's a lot of fear and scarcity, right? You're having a lot of like pearl clenching when it comes to like certain topics or expertise. You're having folks who are writing second, third editions of their book that no one asked for. Um, you're having like folks who haven't worked in corporate. Like, I swear, if I see another LinkedIn post from someone who hasn't worked in corporate in decades, tell us that the future is strategy and understanding business, like I might actually lose my mind. And so, and you're just kind of seeing, um, there's this uh, lack of generosity when it comes to helping us, helping each other win and helping each other grow and like flourish. And for me, that's a signal that it's a really good time to retether ourselves to a healthier understanding of hope and a discipline of hope. Thank you. So I got you. Uh, you don't need to take screenshots. If you want to go to the discipleofhope.com or scan this QR code, I'll send you my slides. I'll send you a free mini course on emotional endurance. I'll send you like a bunch of free stuff. And also too, just for my like neurodivergent friends, I've heard that it's just helpful to have things in advance. So again, if you sign up for that, you'll get it within like a couple minutes. Um, and that will just help you and help each other as we go through today's topic. I figured I would start by sharing some context of what I'm bringing into this talk, especially for folks who don't know me or don't know my background. Um, I'm a black woman, you shouldn't notice. Um, multicultural upbringing, born and raised in America. So, and I, and I know my heritage too. I'm half Nigerian, quarter Korean, quarter Jamaican. Mom's half Korean, came over to the States from South Korea when she was young. So I get the best of both worlds of being raised by a black mom, if you know, you know, and being raised by an Asian immigrant parent. So if you know, you know. Uh, for people who are into this, INFJ, if you're into the Enneagram, three wing two, uh, if you're into astrology, Cancer, Libra for moon and rising. Uh, I have a background in counseling, and then I also have a master's in theological studies. Not a lot of people know about that with my background. Uh, as of today, I'm three years, three months, and five days sober of corporate America. Yes. <laughs> so what does that mean? It means that I'm bringing a more healed version of myself to this talk today. Um, I had someone ask me recently, <clears throat> they're like, how do you know if you've been healing from corporate America? And I told them, I'm less afraid. I don't think I realized like how afraid I was being in corporate America. And because I'm less afraid, I'm trusting my gut more. And because of that, I'm being more creative and I'm being able to kind of step into this energy of like, how do I actually challenge the status quo and challenge things that 
either don't resonate with me or that I know and believe can be better. Um, and it's playing out in some like weird, but like fun ways. So uh, one example I'm going to show is I'm currently building, um, don't judge me. I'm building an astrology for pets app. <laughs> uh, if you go to moonpause.com, you can like sign up to be notified of that. But uh, hold on, there's, there's a point to this. Um, I'm building this astrology for pets app with two other friends of mine who um, are also farther along in their healing journey. And I remember telling them, I'm like, this wouldn't be possible if we were in a more like healed place. And because of this, we're also thinking about, okay, how do we challenge the way that we think about product? How do we challenge the way that we think about business? Um, and how can we use something like a digital app and experience to kind of like test out some of those, those things? So like, for example, um, one of the things that we were going to introduce to this was this idea of like moon treats. This is like virtual currency that you can earn because you know you, you're able to like do these tasks whatever with your pets and then we were like do we really want to continue to lean into this hyper capitalistic system and have like a whole new like virtual like economy within this app and we're like no so we decided to think about how would we be creative in motivating behavior change outside of let me just give you some random stuff so you can buy more digital crap with um another thing that we've been thinking about is like how do we challenge the hiring experience? You know, just kind of seeing what, what's happening right now within our industry. And so one thing that we did was uh, we we're hiring for a couple positions um, and a, a few people for these positions. And one of the things that I thought, I was like, you know, let's, let's do something different. Let's, um, let's do a reverse interview. Let's do a group interview. But in the first round, they interview us. And... That way they can see and understand if they think we're a good fit. We're not wasting each other's time. And then if they want to go on to the next round, they just let us know and they're automatically guaranteed the next round. It's kind of thinking about like, okay, how do I start to think outside the box here? And so I think that's just helpful context as you're kind of understanding like where some of my ideas and practices are um, and the ones I'll be sharing later on in this talk. And so a more healed version of myself, but also... I still have hope for people that are part of this industry. Um, please notice that I said I still don't have hope for everyone. And I think like a lot of us are like so frustrated because we are putting our hope in the wrong people and in the wrong things. Um, and that's not just with like UX, that's with life. I'll give you a good example. Um, I remember going on this date, uh, it was the first date, and um, one of the things that he shared with me was uh, he believed the earth was flat. <sighs> it's like 10 minutes in. Um, these are things like, now I have like new vetting questions. Um, told me the earth was flat and that he believes that there are tropical rainforests in, it, in, in uh, Antarctica. There's no hope there. You don't like put hope in something like that, right? Um, same thing with like UX. There are some leaders, some voices that you're frustrated with, but like you're putting hope in them. Why? You can't put hope in a banking system and believing that it's going to uh, eradicate all forms of the ways it exploits people. So like some of this is like understanding, okay, where are the things, who are the people that I'm putting hope into them, depositing my hope into that actually like don't deserve it. And I want to set um, the ground for this as well. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of things. I know that I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but who as I am, I know I'll be in a big way. And so I want to start with this as you're kind of listening to what I'm saying today. Absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. Do it with this talk. You do it with life. I promise you'll be happier. But again, take what is helpful to you. Um, ignore what irritates you and make what I'm sharing uniquely your own. And the second thing is this, and I think this is a really good quote to kind of capture what I'm sensing in the industry. I'm a big quote person, so we're, we're going through a lot of them today. And it's this. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are Anger and Courage. 
anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. I, I love this quote. And I think too, what I'm noticing in our industry, a lot of people, I understand, there's a lot of things to be angry about. I'm not here to debate that. And I think what I'm noticing is one of the reasons why it's easy, easier to sit in anger, to, you know, have just constantly shit posts on LinkedIn, to constantly like share all the things that are wrong and that are upsetting you is because, especially in a lot of the organizations that we're in and the, and the systems that we're in, we don't have a lot of control. And anger kind of gives you that sense of control again. Feels good sometimes to be like, I can control my anger and like what's going on. It's giving me a sense of power back, right? Um, and so, and there's a time and place for it, but it's really important that we don't linger there. It's really important that we don't build a home there, that we don't live there. Um, for some of you, you might be thinking that you're angry, um, but in reality, you're dealing with something else. I'm going to touch on this uh, in a little bit down the, down the line, but it makes me think about this quote from C.S. Lewis. And he says, I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her real name was Grief. And so for some of you, you think you're angry, but in reality, it's all have unresolved grief. I'm going to talk about a little bit later about how do you do that? Um, how do you start to address that grief? And so when I'm thinking about this quote and the anger that a lot of us have lived in, are in, have been in, are going into. How do we begin to shift out of anger? And more times than not, I find that anger action of helplessness and powerlessness. I think it's really important to kind of get clear. I'm like, what's the difference between these two? Because now you can start to understand where do you actually have influence? Where can you actually change and have some movement? And so um, this is a diagram I created. Let me not die. Um, and so this is how I think about helplessness and powerlessness. Um, I think about the origin of the feeling and the source of control. When I think about helplessness, helplessness is often focused on like internal. So think like internal beliefs, think about um, internal influences. And when I think about power or powerlessness, I think about external. So external factors or external influences in terms of control. Let me give you an example. Um, you're kind of thinking about origin of feelings as it pertains to helplessness. This could be, one example of this would be like in the workplace when someone believes that they lack the necessary skills for a promotion. And so this can oftentimes lead to feelings of helplessness as they perceive themselves of incapable of advancing in their career. And so as a result, they're maybe not as likely to seek out opportunities for growth. They're maybe not as likely to like bet on themselves um, to make the connections that they need to in order to get to where they want to go. When I think about that for powerlessness, not to trigger everyone, but reorg would be like this domain. There's nothing you can do about a reorg. Like, you're not going to be working at a company and you're calling the CEO and be like, yo, I'm not down with this. And can we like switch this up? Um, it just, it is what it is, right? It's an external factor that you can't influence and that's out of your control. Powerlessness. When I think about internal, when it comes to source of control, I think a really good example of this is someone who, despite having the necessary skills, talents, and abilities, consistently feels overwhelmed by their workload. I don't know if that's maybe some of you experience that. And so their belief in their inability to actually manage those tasks and, you know, effectively do their work may result in them uh, refraining from taking initiative, may result in them uh, delaying tasks, you know, uh, delaying their completion of their tasks and their to-do list, and really just experiencing a decline in job satisfaction. But it's coming from this like internal like source, right? Whereas when I think about powerlessness, I think about things like budget constraints. So source of control. So let's say you have this really great project, been working on it for months, for years, whatever. And then all of a sudden the company is like, you don't care about that anymore. So no more budget and that's it. So I think about it in terms of that, right? And so when I'm thinking about how does this play out in corporate, I'm drawing these examples from a lot of the work that we do with our corporate clients and what I've seen over the years of common causes as well as like common triggers. And there's a slew of them, right? I would say these are probably like the top 10 that we're noticing and seeing within our work as we work with executives and teams in the organizations. And um, 
And I think when you like, again, like when you look at this, it's again, too hard to like not be angry and like frustrated. I think frustration is a form of anger. So they're the same thing to me, but it's kind of hard to like not do that. Right. It's kind of hard to not think about that one manager who like screwed you over or like that promotion you're passed over because of whatever it is. And so I think this is like a really important time to like, I just want to like note something when it comes to anger, because we're going to be, you know, weaving in and out of this during our time together today. But one thing I've noticed is that when we're angry, we're more likely to attribute someone's actions to their character versus their circumstance. And usually we're just collateral damage of other people's circumstances. Now, do not read this as like, that's not an excuse. And I've done enough therapy to know that just because you understand why someone does something in their situation and how it's influencing their behavior or how it's changing you, it doesn't excuse it. You can understand it, but it doesn't excuse it. And so when you're kind of like thinking about that, at least for me, it gives me some more space to step back into my power, to not be giving so much energy and like control over to that person because I'm having a little bit more understanding and context about what's going on. And so now the question is, okay, how do we, and how can we kind of protect ourselves from that collateral damage? And that's where, at least for me, comes in practices and rituals, AKA a discipline of hope. It's kind of what I'm thinking about when I think about hope. Hope doesn't preclude feelings of feeling sadness or frustration or anger, any other emotion that makes total sense. Hope isn't an emotion. Hope is not optimism. Hope is a discipline and we have to practice it every single day. What I love about Kaba's quote is that it's a reminder that the answer to feeling hope, the answer to feeling hopeless isn't toxic positivity or forced optimism. I have definitely have been on those like company calls where like things are just garbage and then the cfo was like but we're making so much money we're doing so but the shareholders and like for me it's like okay how do we not try and like force ourselves into hope how do we not try to shame ourselves into hope i see this a lot of like oh people have it so much worse out there and yes but like first world problems are still problems so it's like how do you not shame yourself into something good right um and for me i always think about Okay, what does this mean then? Um, in order to be practical in an engagement with a discipline of hope, because there's a lot that's at stake if we don't have that, which is uh, we lose out on the belief that a better future is possible. That's a lot. That's a lot on the line. And I, I don't know about you, but for me, like, I don't have time to like live in that. Like, I have, what, 60-ish years left on Earth, right? Um, so for me, it's like, okay, how do I actually practically now like engage in this discipline? And so what I'm going to do for the remainder of the talk is I'm going to get super practical. I'm going to share with you some of the rituals and disciplines that I use. Um, I'm going to be talking through them. And again, if you go to that website, there's like a printout of like all the details on how to do all the rituals and whatnot. Um, but what I'm going to do is, uh, well, I'll do something like this, kind of like share an idea. Um, kind of talk about things like the fact that many of us are just at the mercy of a lot of collateral damage. Um, and then propose like, okay, what is the, what's a practice that we can do to remind ourselves um, of hope and to like pull ourselves out of that? So one of the practices I'll share right now is called a uh, ritual of celebration. Because when I think a lot about things on this slide, my mind goes to leaders, it goes to managers, it goes to certain people that allowed me to experience some of these things, right? And so for me, I'm always thinking about, okay, how do I get out of my head? Like, how do I not like linger in this space and in this place because of something that's out of my control, like a crappy manager, I've had them. Um, and how do I like pull myself out through something like celebration? Because we have to learn how to celebrate ourselves without the conditions of needing to appease somebody else first. And that's why this is important and a part of hope. Um, so again, what that looks like, this is like a, a reflection kind of activity that really helps you to think about kind of like the scale of so, you know, successes and wins that you've had. 
a lot of times in corporate and something that I had to learn once I stepped out of corporate was how to actually recognize myself. Because I didn't have the little like employee of the month things or, you know, the like high fives on LinkedIn from other people or like, you know, the, the attaboy from the manager. Like I had to like, okay, how do I actually want to uh, celebrate myself apart from someone else deeming that it's worth to be celebrated? And so here's an activity and like what that could look like. And so again, I'm going to like kind of like ebb and flow a little bit out of some ideas. And then I'm going to share with you like things that I engage in on a pretty regular basis. And the way that I was thinking about doing this is I kind of want to make a case here for like three things um, about our relationship with hope. And I see our relationship with hope is a practice, a rebellion, and a choice. Our relationship with hope is a practice, a rebellion, and a choice. If there's one thing that like, I want you to walk away from, or that I'm hoping even just one of you walks away with, is I want you to understand that you have a lot more options than you even know right now. I want you to step back into the power of your voice. And really, I just want you to bet on yourself, whatever that may look like. And that can look like something within your profession as a UX researcher. That could look like something in your personal life. But I'm not here today to convince you to stay or to leave. I just want to present you with this idea that I think is huge and is foundational for especially the work that we do. Because we're often working with the messiest parts of what does it mean to be human. So I'm going to start here. Our relationship with hope is a practice of self-compassion. Understanding that setbacks are just steps toward growth. Something that I know a lot of us have been seeing and noticing, especially within layoffs, is that uh, a lot of people are really grappling with like shame. They're like, hey, what did I like? How am I the problem? What did I do wrong? Is there something wrong with me? And just in general, and I think because a lot of us bear both the burden and the honor of advocating for other people, we tend to be a lot harder on ourselves when things don't go the way that, that uh, we thought they would. When a stakeholder doesn't necessarily like care in the way that they should. What I've also noticed from working in UX is I think there's a decent amount of folks in UX where um, you were um, the second parent growing up. You grew up with emotionally unavailable parents. You were the ones that had to put your needs and put your wants aside because you had to take care of your siblings or your parent or whatever it may be. And now you're in a corporate setting that really just kind of like reinforces that that uh, slippery slope of self-neglect, right? And so for me, when I'm thinking about the ways that I know I can be harsh on myself, the ways I can be critical of myself, I know that it gets in the way of me being able to step into things that excite me, things that are new, and ways that I can be creative. And so um, one of the disciplines that I engage in is essentially I got to remind myself of who I am. Um, this is called uh, an oriki. Um, basically what it is, is it's a Yoruba greeting, um, Nigerian. And what it means is like, I mean, basically what it means is like, let me just brag on you as I greet you <laughs> because you're like so dope, right? And what I love about this exercise is, and I have a little nice template for you. Um, the way that you start it is first name, middle name, house of your last name. Um, if, you know, if, if you're the first one, you say first of. If you're a junior, you put that in there. And then you list out a bunch of these, um, basically like a noun, which should be either an occupation, a description, um, a status even of a thing. And you're gonna like list out a bunch of these. Now, when you do this activity, have fun with it. Like, please brag on yourself. Like, don't be shy. Don't be intimidated about what that looks like. Um, feel free to use like royal names like queen, duke of, duchess of, um, and get creative with your descriptions. Um, I'll show you what one of mine looks like. Um, and I, I've had seasons where I've had to print this out and like put it next to my desk because I forgot like who I was. Vivian Chue of House Casillo, first of her name, builder and reverer of dreams taker of stages, dame of boldness, holder of hope, conqueror of caucasity, protector of her joy, seeker of inner peace, 
breaker of generational chains. <laughs> and so what I love about this is like, it can change. I mean, you can be flexible about what you swap things out with, but really it's about, again, how do you get really clear on who you are so that you're able to then step into what you can do? And that is a huge, huge part of hope. Um, our relationship with hope is a practice of self-compassion, understanding that setbacks are just steps toward growth. There's a healing nature to hope, often requiring us to make a decision between growing old and growing. Some of you in this room are just growing old. You're not actually like taking an opportunity to like grow. And I think part of that is um, understanding like who we are in contradiction to who people expect us to be or who the world tells us we should be. I think um, part of healing is knowing how to be like kinder to yourself. Uh, I had a friend, um, we'll call him Bill, and Bill was just so hard on himself. Like I have never met someone who's been so um, harsh and unkind to himself. And so every now and then I would text Bill and I'd be like, hey, don't forget to be nice to my friend Bill today. Or hey, like make sure you show Bill some extra love today. And like, sometimes we just need to like remind ourselves that in order to grow, we have to actually like be like kind to ourselves. We have to be careful about how we talk to ourselves because we're listening. And so for me, like there's a, there's a healing aspect to this. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can approach it, but I gave you one example about how you might wanna um, not forget who you are. Our relationship with hope is a rebellion against despair choosing to see possibility where others see none. What I like about this framing, in order for something to be a rebellion, it has to be intentional, it has to be deliberate, and it also has to be an act of defiance. And I love like shaping hope in that way because I think a lot of the systems that we're in are banking on you not rebelling against them and having hope that things could be different. They want you to be a passive participant. They want you to just endure instead of choosing you. And so I love this idea of a rebellion against despair. For me, I think that, I think a lot about the way that grief can play into despair and the ways that we have to be intentional in protecting ourselves from building a home there. Um, building a home in despair, building a home in a place of grief. It is a part of, unfortunately, being on this side of forever. But for me, it's about how do we re, um, reestablish our relationship with grief and despair. And so I think about this as grief is a hallway. It's a transition, not the living place. And it was never meant to become a home. We can't live where we were never intended to take up residence. Some of you have made despair and grief a home. And I understand the temptation to like stay there. Even if you want to get out sometimes, it's just, it's familiar, right? Um, and it can be uh, comfortable because at least you know what to expect in this place of despair and grief. But I'm here to tell you today that it's a hallway and it's not meant to be your home and that you were never intended to take up residence there. So then what do you do then when you are just feeling a lot of grief? Like, what do you do when you are looking out into the industry and you're just seeing things in flame. You're seeing what's happening in the world. And then I know like y'all have family and life stuff going on. I know there's more to life than work and UX, thank God. Um, so it's like, what do you do with that? Cause you can't hold it. If you do hold it, your body's gonna remember it. And I promise you it's gonna play out in different ways. And so one of the things that I do um, is I like to talk about like, I think having a healthy relationship with grief is a really important part of having a discipline with hope. And I know like a lot of times we can uh, try and like move quickly past it, remove ourselves from it. But I would actually say, if you have a healthy relationship with hope, you have a really re healthy relationship with grief. And so one of the things that I do, um, I typically do it uh, on like New Year's Eve. Lately, I've been doing it like three times a year. Um, but like, and that's the nice thing too about it. Like you can do it whenever you want. I typically do it on New Year's Eve as like a reset. Like what do I need to let go in this year so I can move on to other things in the next year? 
And so what I like to do for this is um, I have a series of prompts. Um, each prompt gets about 90 seconds. And I write an answer on one sticky note for each prompt. So some of the prompts can look like this. Uh, what are the lies about myself I need to let go? What beliefs about work and career do I need to let go? What fears and anxieties do I need to let go? Uh, what are the unrealistic or unhelpful expectations that I place on myself that I need to let go? What generational family chains or toxicity do I need to let go? What barriers to my joy and peace do I need to let go? What heartbreak or broken relationships I need to let go? And what's causing me to experience guilt and shame that I need to let go? So I'll do, let's say, 90 seconds for the first one and then one answer per sticky note. Uh, and I just go through the list. And you can add new questions. These are kind of like my templated questions that I always go through. And sometimes I add new ones. And then what I do is um, have like a fire pit or buy like, I bought like a mini charcoal grill thing because I uh, don't have one. And I just slowly like burn the pieces. I like think about a question. And I'm just burning the pieces. I'm like, I gotta let this go. Because like, I can't, can't live here. Um, and you just take your time. Sometimes you have to like pause and like reflect on that person that you need to let go, reflect on that lie that you need to let go. You've been carrying with you for years. Um, and you just take your time with it as you like burn things and let it go. And then you smell like smoke afterwards. So then I love just like taking a shower and I'm like clean again. It's like this like reset, right? Um, and again, you could do this whenever you want. I did this when I quit uh, Salesforce. I've done this um, after having like strong boundaries with certain family members. Um, I've done this even just from like transitioning, even though like I'm in a good place, I'm transitioning to like a new uh, state. I'm like, let me just filter some things out or see what's there. Cause sometimes you don't even realize what you've been holding on to when you do this activity. Um, so again, this is uh, a burning bowl ritual. Um, and uh, I find it to be really, really helpful in terms of how to start to release yourself and free yourself from a place that you have maybe made your residence. So our relationship with hope is a rebellion against despair, choosing to see possibility where others see none. Because what matters most to us often determines the extent of our line of inquiry. And what we believe in often determines our commitment to upholding it. And really what this is, is like, we got to get curious about ourselves. Because when we're not, we're possibly allowing certain barriers to keep us from actually thinking about what's possible. What could be different? What could I challenge? What could I be creative with as I'm kind of going up against this barrier, this problem, this idea that I think could move forward in different ways. And the last thing that I'll, I'll leave you with is our relationship with hope is a choice that requires us to choose courage over comfort. Even if we're experiencing something that's frustrating, that's taking away from our spirit and our joy, sometimes that comfort of knowing there's a paycheck that's gonna be there, of knowing that at least my boss like kind of likes me, will keep us from actually then stepping into where we need to be and where we were meant to be. Sometimes like the comfort of pain, even though it's painful because it's familiar, feels more tolerable than the potential pain of what it takes to heal and to grow. And that's why I think a lot of people don't heal because it's painful. One of the main symptoms of PTSD is avoidance. Like it's, it's painful to heal. It's painful to retether yourself to a healthier idea and thing for you and about you. Uh, and that's why it requires us to choose courage over comfort. Um, and when I, when I often have found myself in these places where I'm like at the crossroads between courage and comfort is I have to realize that more times than not, one of the reasons why I'm picking comfort is because I forgot of who I am. I forgot like what I'm able to do when I actually do step into courage, which I think is really like the state we're all supposed to like be in, right? And so one of the things that I often do is this activity. I'll do this once a year, um, it's called remembering who you are. And basically the way this activity works is um, you are going to ask 10 people this question. What shows up when I do, what qualities do I bring into a room? You ask it in that like just one go. 
Um, if you, again, go to that website, the discipline of hope, Dot com. I have even templates for you of what to text people. <laughs> and what I love about this is when you send it to people who know you, who care about you, who want you to win, um, you're just reminded of the things about you that many times we either take for granted or we forgot. Um, when you, when I, you know, what shows up when you, uh, when you're, when you're in a room, like joy curiosity, fun. I feel heard. I feel seen. I like how playful you are. You know, you make me believe I can do things that, you know, I'm doubting myself on, right? And sometimes we need people to remind us like who we are so then we could step into the things that we want to do and who we were created to be. Um, and so I always encourage people when you do this activity, do it with folks who like know you, care about you, who like want to see you win, who actually like, care about like your spirit, right? Um, do not send it to some rando, <laughs> like send it to someone who like cares for you, who like got you, who sees you. Um, and so our relationship with hope is a choice that requires us to choose courage over comfort. Uh, no one is coming to save you. We have to save ourselves and each other. And I think sometimes we, again, we can live in despair, grief, anger, because we're mad that someone else isn't coming to save us, but no one, no one's coming to save you. And it's really important then that we take a proactive, a thoughtful uh, relationship with ourselves and with other people so that we can then save each other and ourselves. What does it look like to choose courage over comfort? What does it look like to see hope as a rebellion, as a practice? Um, <clears throat> this is my last UX conference I'm going to speak at for a long time, but not ever. And a lot of it is it's not necessarily about the UX industry. It's more of, I think I'm just tired of the exploitative nature of UX conferences. Um, how like a lot of like uh, sponsors and organizers just like exploit us. Um, and I think too, I've just have had like a lot of experiences, especially as a black woman in tech, where I'm like, I think I'm gonna opt out of this. And so for some of you, you're like, I can't necessarily opt out of certain things because I can't afford to fail. And I get it. I can't afford to fail either. Um, it's just me and my expensive dog. <laughs> and he's had, he has to be fed. He's a Doberman. Um, and so, like, I can't afford to fail, but I have hope in, like, what's possible. It means that, okay, if I'm not going to be speaking at conferences, I have to get creative with how I'm connecting with people, which means I just have to try. But I share that example of, like, you don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to opt into systems that don't serve you. And when you start to think about uh, what if I don't have to live in the what if? You can kind of start to get curious and creative about what could be possible. Um, and so um, really like what I just want from y'all is um, I just want you to like bet on yourselves. Like we have whatever in this room, not to be morbid, we're all going to be dead in like 60 years. And um, so why not? Why not bet on yourself? Why not recalibrate your relationship with hope? Why not see like what's possible, what you can be creative with in your work, in your personal life, whatever it may be. Um, and in doing so, um, you'll see that hope is not a scarcity. Thank you.